Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 318. I'm Ben Strano. And I'm Amanda Russell. <laughs> Emphasis on the and. <laughs> yes, necessary. <laughs> Amanda, I have already listened to this episode and it is, I think I was t- Slack messaging you throughout the whole time that I was mixing it. And, mm-hmm. and that shows you how long it takes me to mix an episode because I keep getting interrupted because there's like messages throughout the whole day this is a magic episode i agree and i'm glad you feel that way too i we we had talked about setting this episode up for a bit and then it happened and it was way better than i expected um yeah i just feel like getting this perspective in woodworking and woodworking education is so important but ashley and bonnie just Blew my mind. Like, there's so many quotable moments in this episode. I I literally have sent you, like, we have Slack messages yeah. of me quoting them both. Absolutely. <laughs> and they're both so, so, they have such a great perspective and they're, it's, it's inspiring to hear how grounded they are and how curious they are and how in it they are um you know two furniture makers on like the beginning of their like professional journey after studying for years Mm -hmm. and i just i'm so excited for them the entire time this episode is going yeah it's it's just it's really it's like is humbling the word it's it's beautiful like to hear their perspective on that like Hearing the way they approach everything is kind of parallel, but they're going through different courses in life yeah. and it's 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 a really good episode. I was so excited to have them and so glad we we decided on that. It's it's my favorite episode in a long time. I'll I'll just come <laughs> right out and say it. Um before we get started, uh I it was funny because Bonnie actually mentions uh an, an upholstery teacher. A mi- a miss a yes. mythical upholstery teacher that that she loved learning from, and I'm pretty sure that was one Mike Michelli. Has to be. Has to be. I'm I'm um, signing up for a upholstery course. Oh really? Yeah. After I met Mike, I was like, I have to be a student of yours. There's no way. <laughs> I I met him at Fine Woodworking New England. Okay. And. Um, I had followed him for a while, but we got to talk and I was like, yeah, this is the, this, this is, is going to get me in the right headspace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, well, Mike yeah. is, Mike is incredible. And, um, if you want to learn from Mike, uh, how's that segue? Uh, if you want to learn from Mike, we now live as of yesterday, um, Mike's foundations of furniture finishing course is live mm-hmm. and, at one point while we were filming it, I realized, oh my goodness, this is this is a foundations course. This is like Mike's Mike Peckfitch's course, um, which was just foundations of woodworking, and but it's basically all about joinery and it's the building blocks of everything to come, right? Mm-hmm. And Mike Michelli's course, as we're doing it, I was like this is the information you need to understand everything about finishing. This is not like this is, and, and for the, for the listener, it's not like the super, like, look at this brush stroke. It is understanding the essence of each finish of how to, how to figure out what the product is, like what it's made of and then how you go about applying it based on that information. And mm-hmm. It is the foundation of, uh, that's why we called it that. It's the foundation of furniture finishing. I'm so excited about it. Yeah, that translates. That is so mysterious. Uh, Like, it's such a, like, uh, mystery to a lot of furniture makers of how to finish furniture. Like, it's almost a separate, like, entirely separate thing. And it's so cool that he breaks it down that way. Mm -hmm. And he's just the most pleasant person to do it he's he's a gem he's a gem i'll just say it right now he's one of my favorite people 
and um, it's exciting. It's a lot of information packed into this course. Um, and then we're going to have a live Q and a in August, uh, and y'all will be able to jump on and ask my questions live and interact. And, um, I think, I think if you are like me and have been frustrated and or burned by finishing in the past, not all of us can be Amanda Russell's. Um, but if Say you... <laughs> <laughs> conversion varnish queen of the spray gun. Um, if, if you, um, if you've been burned in the past and you like, for me, I just sit there and go, oh, all right, that's it. I'm just never, I'm never straying away from shellac and or wipe on polyurethane ever again. This is like, this is my home base. And I feel like I'm missing out on things when, when I, act that way um, because there is a reason why all of these other finishes exist. <laughs> um, if you're, if you're married to one, one, if you're married to Schleck, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. It's a great thing to be married to, but uh, there's a whole different world out there and um, Mike will teach you about it. And if you want to just go back to, you know, wiping on Schleck again, that's fine, but you'll do it with the knowledge of, uh, of other things as well. So, uh, findwoodworking.com slash e-learning and check out Mike's course. It's a banger. I am really, really happy that we did it. And I'm so mm -hmm. happy we did it with Mike. He's, he's one of my favorites. The like best. I said. Yep. Mine too. Definitely. Did, did I tell you about Mike's gift basket to me? You posted Mike's gift basket okay, all right, and we all right, should, all right. we should put it in the shop notes. Cause that was cute. It was, that was adorable. a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> that was really sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, enough about like Michelle, enough about finishing, um, enough about gift baskets. Uh, if anything, we need to get gift baskets sent out to Ashley and Bonnie. And, um, or, this is a good one. It's yeah. a good one. So en <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both for joining me, um, this week. Uh, I've been really excited to talk to both of you about woodworking, of course, but education in woodworking. And both of you are kind of on like similar journeys that are paralleled to each other. And um, I think it's going to be a really good, insightful thing into how woodworking classes in different formats are beneficial to everybody. So um, I was, w Bonnie, would you like to? kind of start with your background and how you got started and everything. Sure. So I'm Bonnie um, from Frederick, Maryland, and I've been woodworking my whole life since I was a little girl in the shop with my dad and my grandpa. Um, but just a few years ago, kind of started going down this sort of fine furniture track. Um, so I did the three month intensive at the Austin School of Furniture under the leadership of Philip Morley. And then I'm just a very fresh graduate of the nine month comprehensive at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship in Maine. Um, and at the same time, I've also been getting into um, green chair making. I work for the Chairmakers Toolbox and have learned a lot from being in that circle of people who love to um, make chairs out of trees. So that's a little bit about my background. I love that. We, well, we met um, in. I think your first woodworking class, which was a really yeah. awesome experience to kind of meet you through that. And um, I love the fact that you kind of just dove into woodworking, which is a really amazing thing. And I think can be like, uh, I hear a lot of people asking about like, how do I just make that step and make that uh, uh, start that journey? So I think it it's great to have you here to like hear that perspective and we can kind of dive into that, which will be really fun. Um, Ashley, you, you have like kind of like adjacent ex background, but a different kind of way you approach woodworking and um, yeah, let's, let's talk about that too. <laughs> well, I'm Ashley Piper. Um, I live in Thomasville, PA, and I sort of trickled into woodworking. So it started just by rehabbing old furniture pieces and slowly turned into the fine woodworking tract. Um, I did a one-week fundamentals class at what um, was Lure 
School of Woodworking and then pretty much worked independently for a long time before um, I was in Gary's program, which is a two year online mastery program for fine furniture. How um, how long have you been in that in Gary's program? Um, on the cusp of graduating, I'm finishing on my last piece. So we have our final critiques in July and then um, hopefully I'll be a graduate at that point. <laughs> That's great. That's a long, it's a long time. I mean, nine months also seems like a long time to like just be engaged in that amount of woodworking. But um, the two of you like have very similar journeys and like have dove into the craft and and the education aspect of it. So it's it's great to like hear perspectives on different sides of it you were also at Pinland, right Ashley that yeah and that time I wasn't so much a student as I was an assistant so I was assisting Shar in a fundamentals class and you also get to build along and learn from the instructors so it's sort of like a dual a dual role um but that that was a fantastic experience to, to be able to be on both sides of the coin at the same time <laughs> yeah and Penland's like this or I've heard Penland's like this great just a great environment to be in as far as like um, like immersing yourself in craft period because there's so much going on at the same time. Uh, yeah, super yeah. creative and inspiring and welcoming. And it's, it's wonderful. I highly recommend going there in any capacity possible. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so we have, we have a series of questions. And I feel like if we get started sooner, we'll be, they'll kind of expand pretty easily. Um, so if you guys are comfortable, we can start jumping into questions. Yeah, sure. great. Great. Um, so this one comes from Zach and he's friends with both of you. Um, so he went, he was said uh, before this, he was really excited about this episode, but he, he, he writes in, um, I wanted to ask Ashley and Bonnie what their process is for designing and coming up with ideas for building. I'm someone who loves building and has an ability to see how existing pieces are made, but doesn't have the mindset or creativity to come up with my own designs. Looking for any advice or tips? That's the question, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, yeah. A technical woodworker, you can watch all the YouTube videos and learn all the techniques. It's another thing to be building something that you actually feel good about the design of. And I think it's a journey. And I, you know, the adage is you make a lot of ugly furniture before you make any beautiful <laughs> furniture. I just don't think there's a way around that. Um, but I will say one thing I've learned about my process over the last uh, several months is that I'm a very tactile designer. I can't just open a sketchbook and design. I certainly can't open a laptop and design. For me, I need to be working with my hands. So give me toothpicks, popsicle sticks, skewers, um, little sheets of veneer, and a hot glue gun. And that's how design happens for me. There's something about interacting with real material in my fingertips um, that helps me with my design process. At full scale, designing with cardboard is really great because you can play around around with proportions and see kind of what looks good in the space that you're actually working in. Uh, but it's not easy. So my friend, just keep at it. And you, yeah. and part of the intensive um, was a scale model course, right? If I remember right. Yeah. Um, part so of my three months we did scale models. Um, and I, I don't think I fully appreciated how important they are to designing new work um, as I, as I do now. That's great. Ashley, do you have like a similar approach to that or? Yeah, there's a lot of that, that that I wholeheartedly agree with. For me, I've been trying to learn like digital design and it just, it feels really separate for me and I need to prototype that out. I need the real materials and it just gives a different sense of things like Bonnie was saying um, that just feels like you can figure out different details of the what you're designing better. Um, yeah, it's just more cohesive for me. And I feel more confident moving to those next steps, being able to see it more tangibly. Um, and the same thing, lots of sketching, like iterations of sketching, I think help with that creative process, maybe even before you get to the model stage of things where you can start out with what you think is a, a good idea and look at it and hate some part of it and just keep sketching and augmenting those until you have something that you want to model. And then I guess just having 
the mindset was the key word in that whole question to me, the mindset that you are creative and that you do have the ability to make something unique from your, your own perspective. Um, it's totally there. I think a lot of people rob themselves of that before they even get to the process of putting it on paper or making a model and going from there. And there's lots of times where I've even done those things and I start building it and I change things along the way. I think um, I think that's just part of part of the process and designing in general. And you'll come out with something you like laughter, lots of ugly stuff, too. <laughs> well, I absolutely love that. I think that's really important to bring up is like you have to work out all those like. The things that aren't going to work in order to make it work, like I, th I think that a lot of people I do this I put pressure on myself to like make the best thing up front and it's just like it's not going to happen until you work out all those little like variables and so sketching like do you at the sketching stage stage for both of you do you is it like a pretty lengthy process or it just depends on the project yeah, I think it depends on the project. And I think a lot of mine just start with this little scratched out quick little sketch, um, just different times I'll scribble things in. And sometimes I'll go back to that scribble and then expand on it more to scale and put more details in. Yeah, sketching is a black hole of self-doubt for me. So I try to spend a little time, as little time as possible there. <laughs> um, yeah, I will say I I had an experience a few months ago when I was working on a design for something and just really struggling. And one of my classmates kind of pulled me out of that black hole. Um, at the beginning of our nine month course, uh, we I guess we were just learning to use a cross cut sled on the table saw. And we each had a piece of wood and the instructor just said, OK, just cut this in half and without measuring anything, try to get the two halves as equal as possible just by eye. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, and so I just eyeballed it, made my cut I, by some, I don't know, stroke of luck. They were within a 16th of an inch of each other, the two halves of my board. And um, so in this moment of like design despair, my friend Isaac came over to me and he said, hey, remember in that moment when you just eyeballed it and you just sort of knew what to do? He was like, with the design decision you're making right now, like, you know what to do. Just do it. Um, and that was really helpful because I think when you get deep into design despair, you can overthink and overthink. And and there comes a point in time where you've done this enough that you just kind of know what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this this will kind of tie into a question we have a little later. But I do like that that the feedback, too, has to help, like having that outside perspective. Um when it comes to design work, like I, I love feedback personally, but yeah, even in the sketching stage, I'm like, I don't know, sometimes it doesn't look right, but you gotta just kind of dive in and commit to something. Um, so this next question kind of will, will be specific to each of you, but um, John asks, um, how do in person CFC or remote like Gary Jowski's class um, compare if you get if you can't get to school for an intensive with something like an online mastery program, get you close in terms of results. So I feel like Ashley, you kind of, you've dove into both and I don't know if you've, Bonnie, you've taken like an online course. So I don't, I don't know that, um, like Ashley, you'd probably have experience in both in this situation. And I don't know yeah. if you find one or the other is beneficial or more beneficial or uh, I think it's just a different pathway. Um, I think that your expectations have to be very clear on what you think you're getting from the program when it's online um, versus in person. Um, I think your goals have to be pretty specific. Um, I think you have to have a level of vulnerability with questions and asking and admitting like skill levels or where you think you need help. Um, pretty well um versus when you're in person i think you have the ability to like look to your right or left to another bench or you have the instructor there and that just doesn't feel quite as intimidating as like oh man i have to send them an email and ask them this right now and then trying to make sure those communication barriers um are down um so i i do think ultimately though that you can end up at the same destination. I just think it's going to be a, a different path. Um, I think your just awareness of your goals has to be very clear. 
Yeah. Did you did you take um, like an in person class before you started um, online the online program? Just a one week class. Okay. It was the one week fundamentals, and that was a couple years before this class. Although during my time at the with the online mastery, I had done like little weekend classes in person. So just like a technique focused thing, just a couple times in between. That's great. I've heard. I mean, I know it's different for everybody. For like for me, when I was in 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 classes, it was so important me, for me to get feedback on what I was doing in real time. And so that can be hard too. Is like I don't know, am I holding this right? And I, I don't know how to. But I feel like if you have the like in class um, experience, even a taste of it, I I feel like that could be beneficial, right? Yeah. Where you have a little bit of like, okay, I, I know the the way I'm supposed to be positioning my body, and then the other parts maybe translate. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. That was definitely something I knew taking the online mastery that I was going to sacrifice parts of. Um, it was uh, being able to take a program to, to help me get where I want to go and sacrifice some of those things or not take that and, and do it on, on my own. And so I guess because of my choices that I needed to make, it just it fit well. But I, I knew that some of those things are definitely going to be sacrificed in the process um, that I wish were part of it. But for my availability, just it couldn't happen. And I get that, too. I think that's that's the tricky part of um, woodworking education in general is like, how do you make time in a busy schedule and a busy life like to dedicate a whole week or even a weekend where you have to travel somewhere to have this like experience? So. It's like important to hear these these options and like perspectives on how how these are accessible or how to make these more accessible to everybody. So on the other side of this, Bonnie, you've you've completely dove into an in-person course for a long amount of time, which is something a lot of people consider too when they when they consider woodworking education. So do you feel like as somebody who's who's solely taken in-person courses, like um, do you think like it, it, you, you took some, well, you took the three month intensive, which is, was your first like intensive course. How does that compare to like the nine month CFC program? Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, it's a tremendous gift to be able to put your life on pause and go to woodworking school. And if that's something that's available to you, I would say it's going to be a wonderful time. You'll, you won't regret it. Um, but I've been really impressed with the work that Ashley has made over the two years uh, in her online program. And I can imagine that one of the real advantages of doing an online program is that you're sort of learning how to build your shop and maintain your shop at home at the same time that you're in school and have instruction and support. It was really nice to be at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship where if something breaks, you know, like a text message gets sent and then facilities is there within five minutes, they clean it up, it's done. But then you have to go home to your home shop and learn how do I do this, how to maintain this, how do I um, troubleshoot and problem solve. And, and I think we all get there at some point in our journey where it's like, okay, it's just up to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that might be both an advantage of an, a dis, and a disadvantage of, of an online program is you've got to do it, but you've got that kind of online support at least. Whereas uh, when you graduate from an in-person program and go home, it's just you and your shop figuring it out. Um, yeah, uh, as for the difference between like a three-month program and a nine-month program, I, I mean, I feel incredibly blessed that I got to do both. And I would say um, I was better able to take advantage of the nine-month program, having already learned the foundations and basics in the three-month program. Um, but even just three months, you can go really far in three months. So I, I wouldn't discredit any three-month program full-time. You, you can really learn a lot. I was impressed. Yeah, I was impressed with the amount of work you all did in three months. Um, and I, I, I guess comparing it to myself and how slow I work, it's like I don't, I've never done this much in, in three months. But um, I do love I'd love um, the option to commit to different lengths of time, depending on the person. And I've heard from former CFC students that they preferred um or they're glad they took the three month and I think they have a six month option, right? 
or no, no it's three, three and nine. nine, nine, nine yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, they preferred one or the other, or like we're glad they opted for one or the other. Um, but I mean, I do see like that's a good point. Is there there has to be advantages to the in person versus out, depending on your your situation. But yeah, I was I was curious about this too. Like, what do you, what you feel that um, would would I guess it's just depending on the person, basically, right? Yeah, Ashley, I'd love to hear about um, your relationship with your other colleagues and how much you got to see and know their work and their design styles and how much you got to kind of play off of that dynamic online. That that was interesting to get acclimated to. Um, I think um, everybody has to get comfortable with each other without seeing each other. And so it's like we meet every week for three hours and office hours if you see them. So you have to be willing to be vulnerable again and communicate a lot um, with other people. And so I think it takes a little while for those barriers to kind of come down and people to be willing um, to interact on a level that feels like it would be in an in-person environment. Um, so I would say in some capacities, just it depends on the people you're with. Um, I think it probably in person too, but it, if you feel it a lot more, if you're in a group with a lot of very introverted people that aren't necessarily confident with sharing any of their design process or their perspective or what they're building, you were not really going to get very much of that. Um, people warm up more over time. And I would say the second year has been significantly improved from like how the first year dynamic kind of was. Um, I was lucky to have a couple of people in the class that were friendly and interested in having those kind of conversations. Um, but I was a little nervous in the beginning. So I'm like, this part of why I want to take a program is that same reason that Bonnie was saying her, you know, peer, like kind of knocked her out of that black hole. You, you get a little stuck and you get into your own headspace so easily with this being intimately connected and wanting to do well that you almost need that extra little nudge out like hey this looks great or what happens if you just change this joinery and it just kind of opens up this whole new bubble and so it took a little while to get there with our program but that might be different with a different group of people um so it's a little bit of a roll of the dice um in that aspect yeah i can see that happening really with any class but mm -hmm. but it's great to have that some sort of feedback and some sort of for me it would I needed structure. I knew that I needed some form of education where yeah, I was getting some kind of feedback and wasn't just kind of winging it or so I can't I I'm not good <laughs> in self-teaching, but it's yeah. it's a uh, it's hard to I think because we're in the program, but we're not only there all day. Um, we don't have that focus. We have all of our regular jobs and lives and mm -hmm. families and environment all here all the time. So I think that separation where you would be somewhere at school where you could focus on it is just a little different. So I think that communication dynamic probably lends itself more to that experience too, where in between work or jobs or in their time allotment, they would need to step out of that to communicate too. So I think that that's probably a portion of it as well. Yeah. When you're in a nine, when you're in like a nine month program, even when you're not in school, you're hanging out with your friends from school. So you're talking about wood glue and, you know, <laughs> all those sorts of topics. When you're in school, so it's, it's the things a, we uh, all do as woodworkers, right? Uh, it's like, it's <laughs> as soon as we're together, it's inevitable. We're talking about woodworking stuff. It, it I can't turn it off. So, <laughs> but it, it's great to know that there's like the, uh, like there's this flexibility to the options you have to, to pursue this. Um, I and feel, I would say to anyone listening, if you're considering any kind of woodworking education, whether it's online or in person or two days or a week, just nothing beats education. This is a craft that has been passed down from generation to generation. And although it's changed and there's new technology, there's something still really amazing about learning from another human being and something about saying, like, this is my mentor. This is who taught me what mm -hmm. I know. And mm -hmm. I want to pass on what my mentor taught me. There's, you know, something beautiful about that. Um, it's not just a great way to grow your skill set. It's a part of, you know, participating in the community of craft. Very well said. I agree with that. That's fantastic, Bonnie. <laughs> 
yeah, it does. It does. Um, for a long time, my experience with connection to the craft was all online and like watching other people would work and then, uh, going to community college for it. And then as soon as I started really diving into it and taking actual like formal classes and doing an apprenticeship, it just, it, the woodworking world's so intertwined and it's like, it, it does open you up to that, that world in a way that allows you, like Bonnie's saying, feel connected and feel like, oh, they want to keep this going, like this momentum going in whatever form I can. Um, yeah. So even if you can get into a small weekend class or whatever, like having that connection really makes a huge difference. Woodcraft Supply knows that woodworking is more than just a hobby. It's your passion. And with Woodcraft's new everyday value, now it's a little more affordable. Woodcraft has lowered the prices on hundreds of essentials that woodworkers use every day, like Bessie clamps, Wood River hand planes, type bond wood glue, dust collection fittings, and more. Check them out online at woodcraft.com or go to one of their 70 plus stores nationwide. It's just another way that since 1928, Woodcraft has been helping you make wood work. This next question is from Joe, and he asks, What's the best way to retain knowledge gained in a class? I took a week long joinery class, and since I'm not using these methods, methods frequently I have to keep reteaching myself and that's I'm curious about this too like how you two approach this I don't think I have a good answer only to say that I feel like all of woodworking is reteaching yourself teaching yourself and reteaching yourself take good notes and you'll be grateful for your past self for taking <laughs> such good notes Oh, so true. I have so many notebooks now. That's it. Take notes and I'll go back and review. But it's funny what stuff you're like, oh, yeah, I totally get this. And then when you go to execute it again, you're like, wait a second. <laughs> wait, there's something here I'm forgetting, you know, mm -hmm. but I think it's repetition. Um, that practicing portion of things helps that recall. And some things just start to become second nature that were really difficult at the beginning. But notes help me a lot. But yeah, it's tough when you're a visual learner, too, and you go back to those notes and you're staring at those words and you're like, okay, I have to visualize this. <laughs> I love that you both take notes because I've never done that. And I always wonder because I'm a visual learner, too. So it just doesn't translate to me. But I also think I would have benefited from <laughs> taking just some documentation of what I was doing. But um, as far as like, do you guys keep yeah, when you when you take a course, do you guys keep pretty intensive notes? And like, how do you organize those where you're able to go back and reference them? Because even when I have, it's just this mess of I don't, I don't even know what I was thinking at the time. Yeah, I tried a lot of I, I just have one notebook and I try to draw a lot of pictures to my future self in it. <laughs> the pictures help more than the words often. Um, but another thing that's helpful is if I'm doing something that I know is a little tricky or difficult, I try to take pictures with my camera along the way, this step, this step, this step, or just like, this is the joint when it's apart, this is the joint when it's together, so that I can think to myself later, oh, I knew I cut that joint before. I knew that class was sometime in September. Let me go back through my phone and see if I took pictures of steps along the way. That's great. Do you have like a similar process, Ashley? Are you um, I don't take pictures quite as much because I, I feel like I lose them a little bit <laughs> in, in the process more. The notebooks have been a good cohesive thing for me. I've tried to keep them together. I write the dates and I try like preface the class like real quick at the top and then jot down through um, and just taking like actually writing something out and not like writing an abridged version of it has helped me out. And I take pictures here and there um, if it's something that I feel like I'm struggling through or I'm questioning as I go and the same that way it helps a little bit but I can't take too many because then I'll end up kind of losing them <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> yeah oh I understand that completely I, I feel like I see well it, with Ashley I, I see you do these little like side projects from time to time and it, I mean they're still um to me they always make sense like you made that beautiful hand plane out of was it pink ivory or yes. What? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like little, I see you doing these little projects that are like, I'm assuming adjacent to your classwork. 
They're but, with, yeah, they're bench projects and stuff with the class too. But I feel like those, to me, those make sense as far as like repetition of work, like you're revisiting ideas in these much more condensed projects. And um, do you feel like that's helpful or like something you would continue um, if you were taking commission work moving forward? You would just like, I like to, I don't do a lot of commission work, but I do like to do little side projects all the time to kind of like, okay, here's how to make, here's some joinery I can do on a box or like just, oh, let me remind myself how to do this process a little bit. Yeah, I, have, I think it helps me build confidence in the, those parts of the process. And it's also a little bit of like a pressure release from some of the other parts of this class that have been like more design heavy, more learning heavy, that some of the smaller things feel less pressured because like, although I'm still learning lots when I'm doing it, it just doesn't feel like um, there's as much to lose in that process. And so it's been a nice way to um, flex those extra skills or pick up little details that just in a comforting way, I know that probably sounds silly, but it's um, nice because I'm like, if I mess up this one part of this hand plane, I could toss that little chunk and I feel no worries about it. I've lost some time, but I learned some things. So um, yeah, I like little adjacent projects like that and small boxes and, and other bits and pieces where I can use part of the process that I'm learning, but not have all the extra pressure. Sure. You're not committing to a large commission piece and th then you have to throw away this whole big portion of it right yeah um, and it's not for anybody else I'm not I don't have that pressure of meeting a certain expectation it just yeah kind of just get to be at peace in crafting it and not worry about those extenuating yeah. things that's great uh Bonnie like well because you've been just in the intensive like is it is it something that they enter is is there anything similar to that that they kind of intertwined into the program or is that do you have free time during the intensive to do things like that or or do you have like a practice you do to like revisit techniques that you learned uh, aside from notes I don't know yeah um it's a good question I would say in general that whenever I take on a new project I hope that I'm taking on one or two new skills in that project that I've never done before and using mostly what I've learned in the past. I'm more of a big project person than a little project person. Um, I don't think I've ever finished a box, though I've started three or four of them, but I've finished many bigger projects. Um, so yeah, just, just kind of always going back to the skills you've learned before and introducing new ones as you go. That's a, that's a nice balance too. It's like, yeah, I, I'm continuing to learn new things, but I'm also, re yeah, revisiting those old, or old friends. Repetitive. Old friends is a good way of putting it. That's a really good way of putting it. <laughs> like an old friend, like a bridal joint, like such an old friend. I'm just going to bring back as, as often as I can. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so the next question is from Chuck. Um, he says, I'd like to know... If from Bonnie and Ashley, if applicable, does working at a lumberyard offer any benefits to her woodworking project or skills on the whole other than discounts on materials and the use of milling machines on site? So I know it specifically Bonnie wrote a, a blog on this, which was really great. Um, and we'll put it in the, the notes for the podcast. But um, I don't know if Ashley, if you've ever worked in like a in a nope. space like no, that. This no, this is an all Bonnie question. No, okay. Uh, you're to, you're to listen. <laughs> yeah. I thought it would be um, good too, though, because it is, um, I, my first job outside of uh, woodworking school was in a lumber yard also. And so I have, yeah, thoughts on this, but I'd love to hear, you wrote a really, again, a really good blog on this and um, have a good insight into this. Yeah, so I worked at a lumber yard uh, the year before I went to school part time. So I was doing other things at the same time. Um, while the discount is not something to <laughs> overlook because it is excellent, though it is counteracted by the fact that you are around beautiful wood all the time and it takes your paycheck away from you. I think the real benefit for me was this was my first introduction to so many different species of wood. 
Um, I worked at a place that sold all the domestics as well as many exotics. So just being around all these different types of wood all day long and learning how to answer questions about them, mostly by listening to one of my coworkers answer questions about them, uh, was a great way to understand what the possibilities are, the pros and cons of working with different species. Customers would ask all kinds of questions about different applications, different finishes. You know, what would you use for this? This project, what would you, the first day I was there, somebody asked me what kind of wood to make a crossbow with, and I didn't know the answer, but now I know it's you, you make it with you. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's a real benefit there. Not so much the technical aspects of woodworking, like how to cut joinery. Most lumber yards are just doing very basic milling services. Um, but I will say that you don't have to work at a lumber yard to have a good relationship with your young lumber yard. And I think that's a huge positive just in terms of if you know somebody on the ground at your lumber yard and they know that you really love this particular kind of wood and this particular kind of figure and um, something beautiful comes in, maybe they'll give you a call and say, hey, we've got we've got what you're looking for. Um, I made a lot of really great personal connections at my time because it was like, gee, this is the one place where all the wood woodworkers in town all go. Um, and so it was an instant way to really network with my community. Um, but again, you don't have to work for a lumber yard necessarily, I think, to get the benefits of, of being familiar with your local lumber yard. Yeah, I found, um, did you, did you all, uh, do any like kiln drying there as well, or it was just millwork and? No, we just did millwork. Um, yeah, we, we bought all of our wood, um, some from big places and some from kind of small local mills and then just resold it. But I would say too, uh, I learned a lot about sheet goods when I was there as well. What kind of sheet goods are available, what sheet goods should cost, how much the markup is on these things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as, as we've struggled to get Baltic birch because of the war, we explored alternatives to Baltic birch. So um, your lumber yard, they know stuff about that. So they're good to call when you've got questions, they can usually answer them. Yeah, again, I really love I love the blog you wrote because it kind of just breaks down how to ask for all material. And like, I know that's a very foreign, even um, a part of like my schooling did not involve, I don't know if this is the case for either of you, how to go to a lumber yard and pick out lumber. So that was for the longest time, the most intimidating part is like, I don't know if I'm buying, I think the first time I went shopping for lumber, I bought like two and a half times more than what I needed for a project. And it was like, wow, I did not think it would cost this much. And just how to figure out all of those things is, is so, it's a different language, really. So did you, Ashley, did you have like a, any kind of guidance on that? Or is that something you went and figured out? Figured out on my own, mostly. Like <laughs> Gary is really available for questions. So like if you have questions on those kinds of things or specifics about something, you, he's very readily available for, for answering and gives you great feedback on, on what to look for and, you know, to interact with that. But I, I had been working on it before I really got on to the program and figuring that out. And I'm fortunate to have a couple really nice lumber yards close and the people that work there are, are great to interact with. And so um, I had questions I could ask, but I definitely feel like there's a margin of error in the start of it that I went through and figured out by making the wrong choices a few times, sure, <laughs> which yeah. ones were the better ones next time. But um, no, not really. I really hadn't had like any formal breakdown on what I should and shouldn't do. <laughs> I think too, a lot of woodworkers have this really strong DIY sense that I have to do every single part of the project myself. And I have that maybe stronger than anyone, but you have, we all have limitations. And um, I did two projects prior to going into school in the fall that were both seven foot projects. And the ceilings in my shop are barely seven foot. So I took advantage of my lumber yard and had them um, mill wood for me. Mm -hmm. Just because it was like, it would be so much harder to do it in my own shop. It's not that I can't do it, um, but it'll be easier if I actually just pay the hourly fee for my lumber yard to mill these boards for me. And there's no shame in that. Um, you know, we all have limitations and we can rely on our communities to help us with that. I don't think any of us are growing our trees from scratch, right? <laughs> Building our projects. No, yeah. And, and that 
that too, like it saves you time or wear and tear on your machines. I mean, there's definitely um, availability there. <laughs> That's really nice to take advantage of, like even just getting things surfaced so that it's like reduced time and milling is, is wonderful to have do. And you can see your material so much better before you even get home or, you know, mm -hmm. if you needed something or there was a problem you have, you're there, you can just buy another board or figure out what you need to do. I, it's a smart choice. I agree. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's also a really, um, I don't think we discuss a lot that the, yeah, the outsourcing, um, just even stuff where you, you're just like, I don't even own enough clamps to glue up this top. So what's, why am I doing, you know, what am I doing this for? And if, if it's a hindrance and to me, like making this piece, like it's, it's okay to outsource and, um, they have the machines very capable of doing that and making it making it easier for you to go into your shop and do what you need to do. That's a really good point. So I was watching both of your Instagrams and recently each of you were building, well, Ashley, you're building a chair and Bonnie, you're building a stool, but they're kind of like adjacent to each other. And um, I was curious, uh, kind of goes back to the design question. Like I feel... For me, like a chair seems like a really intimidating project. Maybe it doesn't have to be. And I know you work with chair makers toolbox, Bonnie, but it's like, um, I think a chair is a really a uh, milestone piece for a lot of woodworkers. So I was just curious how each of you approached that and what your design process was and how you felt at the end of it. Like, are you ready to make more chairs or <laughs> what you're doing? But um I'll, I'll start with you, Ashley. I, I know you're kind of. Yeah, I, I agree. I was uh, hesitant with chairs. I was a little nervous to kind of dive into them. It felt like so many different parts that I was completely unfamiliar with. Um, so part of the online class, we had a chair build. So we talked a lot about chairs and design of chairs, but it still felt kind of separate from like doing one. So I would, <laughs> it was a little bit of a struggle for me. So I tried to like just do a lot of outside research and try and find as much information as I could before I really got into the process. It felt a little bit insane to build your own design chair before you built one from somebody else's plans, which I would highly recommend doing first. Um, definitely um, chair plans out there like um, Aspen Golan Zine with Chairmaker's Toolbox. It mm -hmm. has like a wonderful chair to start with. Um, I would say do that before you <laughs> got into the chaos of designing it and doing it yourself. Um, it just was a lot more hurdles of, of like failure and figuring it out for me. Um, but it's a really fun process. Process. Um, once you get like it clicks, it just starts to gel after that point, and it's a lot less intimidating and it's really fun. Um, so I finished the first one and I have material for a second. So I definitely want to build again after accruing all of that experience and time invested. I want to be able to make one and feel like there's parts of it a little bit more easy than <laughs> it was throughout the first one. I love that you dove into that, though. Like, I do feel like for me, it's so intimidating. I'm like, I keep waiting to start a chair, but. Oh, was, just go for it. It is yeah. it's so fun. <laughs> it, it really parts of the things that, you know, already definitely translate and, and it just will will click. And some parts that make sense. I think I was hung up a little bit on the geometry because I wanted it to still be comfortable. But I was trying to figure out how to design for an aesthetic that I wanted. But yeah, so I think having those process parts there um, because of it being my own design was definitely harder than if I had just followed <laughs> plans from somebody else's tested chair that already had those things. No, oh, totally. But it's great. I think I love the idea of just diving into it and getting it working it. again. Like we talked about design earlier, just like working out those those things and you, you're doing it um, largely relying on yourself, but still like leaning into the things you you enjoy about it so it's like this really nice balance between those two things yeah it was fun it, it really was fun as hard as it was it was still very enjoyable and uh, i just i love that you have a form that's been hundreds and hundreds of years old and you right. can reinvent parts of it and create something that people get to sit on and use every day it's just so much fun <laughs> awesome bonnie you also uh just wrapped up a was it a stool it was really beautiful 
Yeah, we've completed our time at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship with a six-week unit on chairs. So um, we had the opportunity to design and prototype a chair from scratch um, with guidance, which was excellent. I think I really took advantage of the guidance that I received in the program. Um, chairs are the best and the worst, right? They are you sort of yeah. the pinnacle of a uh, woodworker's, uh, furniture maker's um, creation and the uh, there's a lot that goes into a chair, yeah. <laughs> a lot of angles and measurements. Um, but the great thing is that by and large, those have already been figured out. Like you can read a book and it can tell you um, how high a chair should be, how high the armrest should be, what your options are for the included angle between the seat back and the seat itself, the tilt of the chair seat, all of those things. Um, have been wonderfully studied and are are out there. So um, I decided to make uh, counter height stools with backs. So very chair like, um, mm -hmm. and really enjoyed the upholstery part of that. We got to have a day with an upholsterer at school. That was one of my favorite days all year. Um, so I did the leather upholstery for the for the chair seats. That was a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. I thought I feel like I remember you doing the cushions for the. Morley lounge chair, right? So you have yeah, like some I, sewing experience, and I do have quite a bit of sewing. Yeah, um, quite a bit. Sorry, so not so. <laughs> kind of fun to bring that. It's fun to bring sewing experience into furniture. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, and it is like comforting hearing from both of you that it's that, yeah measurements are decided so already or have yeah. been established yeah. there's <laughs> great resources out there i mean really great resources where they um even stuff online and in books and plans they have things laid out so well and it's such a good community of people um like Brian kept referencing community is huge in all of this and i feel like friends answer chair questions other chair makers i've never really talked to were like happy to tell me about different things we're like oh if you look at this plan it'll show you something you know with the seat to the back or something with spindles or a jig for drilling and so there's wealth of information and wonderful people out there so i i say go for it if you're thinking about doing chairs just there's resources it, it'll be fun yeah i also think it's it's also worth bringing up you brought up um aspen scene um, on chair making, but the chair makers toolbox, which Bonnie you're involved with is a great program for somebody trying to get education in woodworking. There's a lot of scholarships, right, available. And that's a pretty frequent thing, which I think is so important to bring up is like people looking into woodworking education. There are a lot of resources for scholarships and, and opportunities. And um, I'll definitely link that also in our our podcast notes so people have a resource for that um but i just love that it was kind of a line that you two were working on a similar project at the same time and exploring <laughs> that in a different way um i have a, I have a few more questions if you all are up for it um one being um our first one being how much experience would you recommend before starting a long program, which kind of was discussed earlier, but I think it would be good to just kind of hear what you two think or what, how you two feel you would prefer to be before you started a, an intensive of some form. I think the nine month program would have been difficult to do as a true beginner. Mm -hmm. And so I would have recommended, um, as much, you know, as much experience as you can get. Um, but don't wait too long because there's also no time like the present, if that makes sense. But Absolutely. I would say, yeah, I I mean, I certainly benefited from having a three-month intensive prior to the nine-month. Um, you don't need a three-month intensive, but even taking a couple of week-long classes, I think would, and, and trying to do some things on your own, I, I think would certainly help. Are there are there like prerequisites for entering that program? I'm not super familiar with it. I, I'm not sure. Um, you submit work with your application. So I'm not sure what they're looking for in terms of, of previous experience, but I do believe it helps. That's great. That's good to know. I feel a lot of people are, are uh, people I've talked to are not sure how, how to approach even applying for stuff like that. Was it this? Was it the same for you, Ashley, with Gary's uh, program? 
Yeah, very parallel to what Bonnie was saying, where um, we submitted an application with our work. Um, and I think especially being in an online class where you are in your own shop and you you don't have, you know, another person to like help you with the body English or awareness of some things that you want to have a pretty good fundamentals base set up because um, otherwise you're going to struggle. I think you need to be comfortable with that like foundational skill set so that way you can like elevate yourself through the program. I think it would be really tough to keep up designing and figuring out everything along the way otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I do think a lot of people, uh, a lot of people I've spoken to have a lot of questions about that in particular. And then um, second question from Ben is, um, do you have any tips for getting out of a rut when you feel like you're not progressing as fast as the others, particularly in the class? So I don't know if you've been in the situation class-wise where you feel behind or, you know, um, yeah, yeah, just, um, I, I think it's easy to get, compare yourself to others. I've like assisting classes. I've seen this a lot where people are looking at each other and they're like, well, I'm not at this stage. And what do I, what do I do? Um, I don't know if you've experienced this either. I, I, Bonnie, I always talk about you in the first class I met you in felt like you were just at this very, like, you, you were just floating along and it was your first formal woodworking class or? Yeah. I mean, I think my advice here is to thine own self be true. <laughs> like just stay the course, whether you're ahead of everyone or behind everyone, just stay the course, um, stay true to your own speed. Um, yeah. Sometimes there are people leagues ahead of you and they're doing terrible work. <laughs> and sometimes there are people ahead of you who are doing great work. Um, just, stay true to your integrity as a woodworker. I, I do think that um, there is a balance between efficiency and perfectionism. And I do sometimes see people really err on that side of perfectionism and they don't get very far. And I consider myself a little more on the side of efficiency, um, but I still obviously believe that my work is of, of a quality that it's, it's still good enough. Um, and I think it's important for everyone to find that balance between perfectionism and efficiency. Um, and once you find where you are, stay the course. I really like that advice because I always use you, you as an example in particular, because out of all the classes I assisted, again, I've never seen somebody just kind of like comfortably float along in a class. And you're typically like at the end of the line when it came to using machines. And somehow at the end of it, you're ahead of people uh, here's my <laughs> secret tip for these classes everyone goes and uses the machine use the other one like do the other <laughs> thing first like get first in line on the machine that no one's using yet that's always been oh, my okay idea. okay so I, I missed that kind of like you kind of catch up at the end um but that's true like in your own shop right you're like mm -hmm. well the table saw is not working today so what can i do on the band saw you're like, you're always kind of, or you're like, oh, I don't feel good today. But like, what do I have the energy to do? Let me do that yeah. thing. That's a really good strategy overall, too. Because I do have days like that where I'm, like, well, I really don't feel like doing this complicated joinery, but I'm comfortable with millwork. Like that's not mindless, but a lot less effort. So let's get this knocked out. Um, is that like your experience, Ashley, with, with the online course? Yeah, definitely. I think you have to keep yourself in check and don't be your own worst enemy. Um, I think realizing that comparison's the thief of joy and all of this stuff and that you're on this journey because for your, yourself and, and your own way through it and that that's rewarding, even if it's not on pace with somebody else. Like Bonnie said, the quality of your work can differ greatly from somebody else. What you're doing can differ greatly from somebody else from different kinds of technical levels. Um, there's so many differences there um, that I think it you can't get lost in that too much because then I think you're losing your focus of, of what you're working on and why you're there. And I think that can steal away your sense of community in the class as well. And I think that's something you want to keep in balance. Cause I think once you start comparing like that, then you're like demoting yourself down and it, it's just, mm -hmm. um, you can't make your best work right when, when you're like that either. So, um, 
no, it's certainly not an easy thing to do because you're trying to learn and learn off the people around you as well. But um, yeah, just trying to keep that in balance that you're doing the best work you can Mm -hmm. at, at every point. So, and that's good enough. I also love, I've always, I've thought about this too, is like a lot of at least classes I've been involved in have been project based. And um, I think that kind of drives people to feel like they have to complete this whole task, uh, this task as a whole, instead of recognizing like all the learning opportunities that come within a project. And you can take this home and finish it on your own time if you're retaining all the information that's happening during the class. So I like that's a hard thing for even me. When I started out, I was like, I have to finish. Like, I'm not even focused on what's happening. Like, I need to complete this before I get out of the shop. And like, as as I continued and as I watched classes kind of from the outside, I recognized, oh, like, uh, there's so much. I can walk away from this with so much more retained information than just this finished project. Like that that can happen on a different time if I if I'm present. Kind of what both of you are saying. If I'm present in tune with myself and retaining the information presented to me instead of like worrying about like goals or goal marks or, you know, it's, it's a different. That's, yeah, yeah, that's why I like the technique focused classes because they're not a project and you're really just working on one part uh, of that skill set and not worrying about making this like fantastic cabinet, you know, which there's nothing wrong with that. I think it, oh, there's absolutely. a lot to learn and no matter what the um, format of the class is. But for me, that that helps. So I, I haven't had that where I'm like, I need to finish this table by X amount of time and like the panic of it. Like instead, I'm just like, I want to be able to saw this <laughs> properly. <laughs> yeah. So it, it takes it's a little different. <laughs> right. And and then like what Bonnie said, where you're like, I'm going to the other machine where I'm yeah. given the space to not rush through this process and kind of like assess it. And you walk away with a lot. I feel like you walk from personal experience, you walk away from a class retaining a lot more and learning a lot more because you're taking the time to actually like understand why things are happening instead of just getting it done to get something done. So, which I, I also understand too, like if you don't have access to a shop outside of that, I understand the rush to get a project finished, but it's nice to like be in a class and retain, like have the time to go, why am I doing this thing in particular and why is it happening this way? Um, that's that's really cool to hear both of you kind of parallel that, that insight at the same time. <laughs> um, and... So we have we have one more question, um, and this is I won't even read this one, but this is something that uh, Ben and I talk about all the time because we both have backgrounds in or creative backgrounds, and part of like my schooling involved critique. Same thing with him, and he he was talking about you know I I looked forward to critique because I was actually getting this like direct feedback of what I'm doing, and there's not a lot of opportunities in life to get this unrestrained feedback on your work. Um, Has that been something beneficial that both of you have experienced from being in a formal classroom where you're getting this direct feedback and it's structured enough to where it's like, you know, the person's allowed to say what they're thinking. (laughs) That's, that's what I've always liked is like when I went through critique and I took art classes in college, it was, I knew I was getting feedback that was, honest because it was in this structured environment where you're actually supposed to do this so it's not there's no like ego involved it's just this is beneficial for everybody so I don't know if you two have experienced that and you find it beneficial or um or how you navigate that I guess I imagine CFC is that's a, a pretty big window of it right you know, um, the fellows at the CFC do a lot of formal critique in the nine month. It wasn't a huge part of our program, but I think oftentimes it's the informal critiques that are more helpful. The informal critiques that you really seek out, you go to your trusted colleague, you go to your professor, you go to your partner, you go to whomever and you say, hey, I'm not sure about this thing. What are your thoughts about it? Or I'm considering this, but I'm also considering this. What do you think? I think those are those sort of informal critiques have often been uh, more more helpful to me. Um, I think oftentimes in formal critique setting, uh, people can just 
sort of focus on what they like or don't like about the piece. And that's often really helpful. Mm. I like that. And I, I tend to do that now, like having two shop mates has been beneficial for me because I'm getting some form of that, but in a more intimate level. And they understand like what that operation is in the pro and that step. So it's not this big picture thing. It's like each step of the way. Oh, I like that. As Ashley, do you, do you, is that a part of, is critiquing a part of? Uh, yes. It is. Yeah, it's a part of our program. So each project or set of projects that we've had to submit has been a whole critique class on everybody's work for that whole class. So um, just say we had to do like a low bench or a, a table. We had like certain criteria that we have to build to for each critique. And so that has to be part of your piece. But other than that, the rest is all your own design and whatever you come up with. So um, critiques are really helpful in that aspect. Um, I hadn't had a lot of experience with a, a formal critique at all before this. So it was all a learning curve for me. Um, I was fortunate enough to have um, a peer who's architect background um, really helped out significantly. So the she would ask really good questions and it was a lot more of a question shaping process about things that you did in your piece that would make you reconsider parts of it or think of it differently. And it was a way to separate your vantage point. Some that would, would give you clarity maybe on if you were to rebuild the piece, what you might change or do. Um, and it only seemed to help with like proportions and scale or different detail focuses, like as the program went on, which, which was really beneficial. Um, and also getting to hear your peers critiques or questions or things that happened on their work since it's different than your own no matter what the prompt was you could kind of learn from that and so i would take notes even on other people's critiques because it would be a point that i hadn't thought of in my own work so i, I found them overall to be really helpful yeah that's that's great so like what what would be the example of a prompt like for something um, like that so we had like sushi boxes like the first project we did was like a, a hand cut half lap joints um and so that's what it had to be it had to be a box no hinges and the hand cut half lap joints um we had to do the low bench had to have mortise and tenon um we had to do um a piece of knife hinges. um yeah so there was um prompts for each critique but um yeah gary lets you free reign besides that one technique that we went in class so you could go wherever with it. <laughs> That's cool. I like that. That like a little element of structure, but full creativity outside of that. Mm -hmm. It's really neat. That's awesome. Um, so now that well, you're about to wrap up Ashley and you've just wrapped up the intensive. And so you guys, you guys are kind of in the same like little window of your journeys as far as woodworking. What, what is next for both of you are, what do you see yourself doing forward, moving forward? Uh, hopefully just continuing to take commissions and um, staying busy with those. Um, it's been a time differential with class that now that that's going to be done, I feel like I can focus on that mm -hmm. work more. Um, so open for commissions and then um, hopefully some gallery work, maybe. I'm going to try putting myself out there differently um, and, and check out other opportunities around um, and see where that leads me. Do you have a gallery, um, some form of gallery showing coming up or? Uh, just a local art alliance um, that's going to be doing um, local craftspeople for a month featured in the fall. So I'm going to have some work in there and that'll be a foray into that experience. <laughs> that's great. Where is where is that happening? It's going to be in Gettysburg. Gettysburg. That's great. Mm -hmm. A specific gallery or? Um, just at the local, there's the Art Alliance, I think, is a building. I actually haven't even been over there yet, which <laughs> I need to do. So I have to do some checking out to, to do the space. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. And you, Bonnie, what do you, what do you have moving forward? You just got back from Maine. So yes, I'm cleaning the cobwebs out of the shop and <laughs> resting. There's <laughs> a lot of bird poop to take care of. But beyond that, I've got a couple of commissions lined up and looking for more. I'm um, continuing my work with the Chairmaker's Toolbox and um, going back to a half-time gig in the church world, which is my first career. So um, my plate, I think, will be full of all the good things. Absolutely. Yeah. Sounds like both of you are going to be super busy coming up. That's great. Well, thank you so, so much for doing this. This is something I looked forward to doing for a while. 
Um, and you two are just so insightful on this. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. You've always been such a wonderful supporter and friend and cheerleader. So <laughs> grateful for your work. As- well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Thank you so much for listening. Head on over to finewoodworking.com slash e-learning and check out Mike Michelli's Foundations of Furniture Finishing course that's coming up in August. We're excited for it, as you can tell. If you have any questions you'd like answered on the show, please send them into shoptalk at finewoodworking.com. If you're watching on YouTube, that thumbs up button sure helps. And a five-star review on iTunes really helps. And we sincerely appreciate it. And the other thing that we sincerely appreciate is all of the Unlimited members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. (laughs) All right. That was a pretty good intro, I feel like. I think like... We're getting it. We're getting it. Yeah, for sure.